morning. I think winter came back. What do you think? I think winter came back. Well, that's okay. It's not going to be forever. Glad to see you all this morning. Our young adults, our pathfinders, are on a on a trip together. They went up to Olean, New York, I believe. They're, they're attending a church there, uh, and the pastor there is one of the speakers that will be the speaker at their conference. They're heading up there, and so we miss them, but be praying for them that they have a safe journey and a good time of fellowship together. And I know another one is uh, working like a 12-hour shift today and couldn't come, so we're glad that you're all here. And praise God that we're together. Is it good to be in the house of the Lord? Do you want to have a heart that is a heart that is a good, praising heart? That was the prayer of John of Charles Wesley. We're going to sing. If you want to uh, use your hymnal, you can. It's uh, 440, and the words will be up front, too. And then if you want to put your finger in 76, I believe it is. Yes, 76. Otherwise, I'm sure you'll know this. Let's all stand, and we'll sing it. Surpass that and uh, bless them with uh, a hefty 
uh, financial gift to help get that, uh, be a part of getting that ball going. That, that's going to be a great addition to their ministry there. Um, also, today after the service, we'll be having our agape uh, lunch and dinner. Uh, who knows what agape means? Raise your hand. You'll have to say it out loud, too, if you tell me. Uh, Ms. Bean, what is agape? God's love. All right, ten points for you, Mrs. Bean. Thank you. God's love, that is the unconditional love of God, the agape lit dinner. So when you go to 1 Corinthians 13, it says love is this, love is that, love is this. All of those are the agape love, God's love, um, and how it's expressed. So that's going to be a luncheon after the service today. So we encourage you to hang around after that for some good food and fellowship. And some things that are coming up, preparation is already uh, rolling for our Congregational General Assembly meeting in May. So in your bulletin are some deadlines that we were discussing at our last business meeting. Uh, nothing really pertaining to this month, but uh, before long, these will be some things that will be uh, uh, some nomination committee, a budget committee, uh, and things like that getting up, so uh, reports and things. So just kind of look at that, and I'd encourage you to put these things on your own personal calendar, maybe, things that are going to be due uh, in preparation for our General Assembly meeting in May. Uh, so there, there that is. And I think Faith had a, uh, an announcement. Yes, in regard to that, we do need two members at large for each of the two committees, the nominating committee and the budget committee. So if you're willing to be a part of that, if you could see, probably Dick here. So, um, Also, ladies, uh, we are starting a new study. And so now's a good time to come to our meetings for the second Saturdays of each month at 9 o'clock in the morning. So if you have a hard time making that and you would like to start your own study, let me know because we can study this together. It's very, very easy. But we need this book. We're going to do Following Christ, Experiencing Life the Way It Was Meant to Be by Dr. Joseph Stoll, who used to be the uh, president of Moody Bible Institute. This is a wonderful, precious book. I think you will really enjoy it, be challenged by it. We're going to go through this book uh, one chapter at a time. I believe there's 10 or 13 chapters, one or two chapters a, a month, and talk about it and see what God is going to do with us with this book. If you would like a copy of this book, though, um, we can get it for you for $9.99, no shipping. And uh, so it will be with tax, plus tax, I believe. Right, Lois? Lois is here. So with C. Lois or Alice, if you would like a copy of this book, okay? And we'll get it in bulk, and that way we won't have to pay for shipping, all right? So, following Christ, be sure you join us the second Saturdays of each month. Sounds good. All right, well, praise the Lord. Well, I hope that you did come with a heart to praise the Lord today, and, uh, uh, at the end of our Sunday school class, we always pray, Lord, just stir our hearts before we even get upstairs. You know, sometimes you get up here and it's praise time, it's testimony time, and we're sitting there thinking, okay, it's over with, let's go to prayer time. And then you think, oh yeah, I would like to share this. So be thinking about a testimony and praise that you have uh, toward God. Uh, and we'll share those things a little bit later in the service, all right? I'd like to invite you to stand with me. We're going to unite our hearts in prayer and then continue our time of praise and worship. Our Holy Father, as we gather this morning in the name of Jesus, we gather uh, together, Lord, and uh, how important that is that uh, with other brothers and sisters, with your Holy Spirit presence, the presence of Jesus, the presence of Almighty God, with us here today, Lord. And uh, we're so thankful for the ways that you show yourself faithful to us this past week, the opportunities that we may have had to point someone towards the Lord in our conversations, opportunities to lift up someone who was uh, needing encouragement. Lord, thank you for those opportunities this week. Thank you, Lord, for the uh, opportunities to pray with people and for some receiving answer to prayer and Lord we thank you so very much for 
your presence and work and intervention and involvement in, in every aspect of our lives and of this church, Lord. We just pray and ask you, O oh Holy Spirit, to carry us along today and uh, as we worship. And uh, Lord, we just pray that uh, you'd be glorified in our thoughts, in our words, in our hearts. Uh, Lord, may the song of praises be a testimony of our own hearts. And may the prayers that we pray uh, be from our hearts as well as we agree together in times of prayer. Thank you, Lord. We do love you and thank you that for all the reasons and all the opportunities that we do have to serve you and to connect with others, to share our hope. We we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you, Becky. It's nice to hear the organ for a change. Uh, as we go to praise time, uh, anyone have anything to share today? Uh, yes, there's a, uh, again, a site, uh, a man, uh, McKay, I think is his last name, does not yet know the Lord, but he seems to be very clearly seeking, and um, he's humorous, he has a, a, a site called The Art of Manliness. Well, it is a, a, um, a how-to on developing yourself as, as a, a man rather than just a male, and um, I, I think he is clearly seeking, so he's someone for us to be praying for and to be hopeful for, because he's, he's clearly, he's, he's on to something, and uh, yet he doesn't know the Lord yet. So he does quote him from time to time, from, from things, but various other things as well. But anyway, that's someone to look into and, and to be praying for, oh, excuse me, <laughs> to be praying for. So, thank you very much, Glenn. McKay is the guy. All right, anyone else have anything? I just wanted to uh, say something. I don't know if everybody, I know not everybody, but maybe most people remember the Gardner family that was here for attending for a while and then they got stationed in Hungary. We've been keeping in a little bit of contact, but both families are so busy that uh, we don't talk that much. But we got a, a nice care package from them. We had sent them one for Christmas and then we got one from them yesterday and they sent a little note along. So they're they're thinking of all of us. They still would like to move back to PA, so it would be nice if they're close. They might still be able to come back to this church. So, But uh, their family's doing well. They've had a lot of uh, adjustments and some stressful times, but they're, they're doing okay. But I just kind of wanted to give an update on that. Thanks, Chris. Anybody else have anything to share? I wanted to share about uh, a contact I had. I was getting my phone uh, reprogrammed or updated, and there was a young man there taking care of me, and uh, he uh, said, uh, do you have any wisdom for me? Uh, you know, he was only 19 years old, and so I... Uh, I thought, wow, this is a tremendous opportunity here to uh, tell him about uh, the most important issue in life, and that is, what are you going to do with Christ? I gave him a, a tract and uh, had an opportunity to speak with him a while about, uh, you know, trusting the Lord, living for Him, and uh, making sure that uh, uh, who He uh, dates and marries is also. A believer and that the two of them uh, uh, should form uh, you know a union that is uh, dedicated to the Lord and uh, on the same page and everything he seemed to be very interested and in, uh, uh, had some knowledge of scripture from earlier on so uh, uh, this was a, a real praise time. Yeah. Good opportunity to an easy one right there. Yeah. Yes, last week I mentioned about Melvin being confused and everything. And I went to see him three times this week and his confusion seemed to be easing up. He was talking like he knew what he was talking about. And we just praise God for that and just keep praying for him. Thank you. I need to keep praying for Melvin. Anyone else have anything to share today? Tim. Yeah, I'd like to thank the Lord for safe traveling. We just got back early this morning to a trip to Florida. Uh, we visited my sister in her new home down there for the first time. And uh, we've seen a lot of accidents on the way down and back. And the Lord kept us safe. And we just thank you for the Lord for the time away and safety and time to be with family. Thank you, Ted. Welcome back to the cold north. 
Anyone else have anything to share? Oh, one more. Don't know how I forgot what I did. Um, <laughs> we have uh, Jay and Danica here, his uh, now fiance um, at the church, so they're going to be getting married this summer. So that's kind of really awesome news. So I'll just share with the church. Anybody else? We can go to prayer then. We sang about the holiness of the Lord. Isn't it wonderful to know we can understand a little bit about that holiness down here on earth? And I was thinking we sang the angels sing it. And we can join them. And they can join us in this part of it, can't they? But there's going to be a song of redemption that they can't sing about that we can won't that be wonderful? Can you imagine what that's going to be like? Oh, how wonderful. Right now, we need to just continue to dwell on him and think on his holiness. We serve a holy God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. Early in the morning, my song will rise to thee. Only thou art holy, merciful, mighty, God in three persons, precious Trinity. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We worship you today and give you praise. Come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving. Because, Lord, you've been so good to us. We thank you for the testimonies that have been shared today. And so grateful, Lord, that you know every need that was mentioned. And we thank you for the answer regarding Melvin. And, Lord, we're believing you're going to give him a clear mind so that he can make a full, unconditional surrender to you one that will be certain he's made. Thank you, Jesus, for continuing to work in his life. Thank you that he accepts prayer from his sister. Pray, Lord, that you will just continue to bring that special touch to his life until he is totally, unconditionally surrendered to you. We want to continue to remember Patsy Slosher in prayer. Lord, she's gone through so much and we just pray that you would bring that complete healing touch to her body today. Be her strength. Be that healing portion. And we'll give you thanks. We pray for this 19-year-old that Mr. Dingletine had a chance to witness to. And pray, O oh God, that he'll continue to search for you. Holy Spirit, the seed has been planted. The word has been given. Now, Holy Spirit, work in that life until he is totally surrendered to you in your perfect will for his life. We thank you, Lord, that you brought our Ted and his family back to us safely, giving them a time with family, bringing them back home safely. Lord, we're, we're so grateful. I guess only eternity will let us know how many times you saved us from accidents. But we thank you that we can believe you to bring us through every time safely and we'll give you praise. Lord, we pray for this gentleman that was, was mentioned today, McKay, I think his name was. Oh God, that you would just work in his life until he's made a full surrender to you. And Lord, we pray for everyone in our prayer list with cancer. We have a number here on our list. 
Oh God, would you just visit these homes with that touch today? And may we hear reports of your healing touch in their heart and in their life. We also want to pray for the wars that are going on right now, both in Ukraine and in Israel. And oh God, we're just asking you to minister in a very special way. Especially, Lord, we pray, give wisdom, direction, and guidance to Netanyahu. And Lord, may you bring peace to Israel once again, we pray. Holy Spirit, work in that situation. We're believing you, Lord, and trusting you. And also, both Ukrainians and Russians that are hurting because of this war, we just pray that you would minister there. Lord, work and move. God, grant wisdom. Grant peace. And Lord, we'll thank you. And oh God, the remainder of this service we leave in your hands today, thanking you in advance for all that you're going to do. Speak to us through your word today and help us to take the word that's shared. And, oh God, apply that to our hearts and to our lives. We'll thank you. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare our hearts to receive God's word, I'd like you to open up in your hymnals 441. 441. I'm getting some feedback. You want to turn off seven, probably. 441. 441. What we're going to do is we're going to sing the first verse together. And then the second verse, I'm going to change a key that's easier for the men. I'd like the men to stand and sing the second verse. And then remain standing. The women will stand and sing the third verse, and then together we'll sing the fourth verse.
chapter 19 sure reflects um, the potential failures that can take place in a person's life when we have not allowed God's Holy Spirit to develop and nurture His holiness in our lives. Today we are in Judges 19 and our focus is on when people fail you. When people fail you. in verse 1. I will start off this morning. Judges 19 and verse 1. Now, they, it came about in those days. What are we expecting next to hear? And everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's what we would expect to hear, right? Four times in the book that's mentioned. But these last two chapters, chapter 18 and chapter 19, it falls short of saying... Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So he says here, just like in verse eight, chapter 18, Now it came about in those days, and instead of saying, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes, it just describes what that looks like. And that's the description from here to the end of the book of Judges. What it looks like when, God's, when people, many of them God's people, do what's right in their own eyes. The reference, and I will read this from um, Matthew and Henry. The reference to Israel's lack of a king in 19 verse 1 points to, the, points to the Israelites' practical denial of Jehovah's lordship over them. The refrain, Israel had no king, occurs four times in chapters 17 through 21. It brackets the stories in chapters 19 through 21, which is where we are now, and provides the key to its interpretation. This incident shows what happens when God's people fail to acknowledge his sovereign authority over every area of their lives. In chapters 17 through 18, the result was religious apostasy or idolatry. In the following chapters, 19 through 21, the idolatry leads to moral degeneration or immorality, along with political disintegration, which we might refer to as anarchy, and even social chaos. While there is no king in Israel to give godly direction, there are still the opportunities for God's people to offer personal influence from those who are following the Lord. So even though there's not a king there guiding them godly, there are still people who should be godly enough to provide an example of what it would look like if God were drop guiding them. That is, the holy character of God should be displayed in his people. But that's always the case. Where there is no ruler or godly ruler, there is great need for God's people to make a difference by their own holy individual lives and godly influence upon all those around them. So we can't just blame it on our ruler. We can't just blame it on no king or a godless king. 
we still have the responsibility to live holy lives before God and before others so that they might see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. So don't be too quick to, I guess, criticize those over us unless we're living the holy life ourselves. So today we look at when people fail you. When people, people fail you. This whole chapter basically revolves around the failures of marital relations. You have a man, you have a concubine, and his wife, and it gets real complicated. It gets real complicated. And that's what this chapter is about. The problems and complications of not living holy lives as God's people. So Judges chapter 19 again, verse 1. In those days when there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite was sojourning in the remote part of the hill country of Ephraim. Ephraim was a portion of Israel's people. Of Ephraim, who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. And his concubine was unfaithful to him, and she went away from him to her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah, and was there for four months. I was so glad when the kids left today. First time ever. Glad, glad they're out. I didn't think this was kids' day, but thank God he got them out of here. A concubine can refer to a prostitute, but can also be used in terms that relate more to an actual wife, almost like a secondary wife. Not all the privileges or status of the prime number one wife, but can still be viewed as wife. But we see in this passage when one person fails, and another one pursues that failed relationship. There are some good parts in this chapter. They just don't stay good very long. So while this woman is referred to as a concubine, her man, and I'll call him that just because it's a lot more less confusing just to call him, him the man at this point. But when she is referred as a concubine, her man is also referred to as her husband. And the woman's father is referred to as the man's father-in-law. And the man is referred to the father-in-law's son-in-law as the son-in-law. So we see all of these. I mean, she is a concubine, so we would say she's a secondary wife. And it appears that they're genuinely married under their culture and their context at that point. Because of these other terminologies that describe them in clearly marriage contexts. But this is not only a lesson on marriage reconciliation, but also on moral failure of those who live outside of God's word and his will. And even today, those who are living outside of the lordship of Jesus Christ, even as believers in the church today. So the concubine, wife, woman, was unfaithful to her man, husband, concubine owner. No other details are brought forth out from this. So we're going to re refrain from speculating too much. What was it that happened that made her leave? I mean, if you look at a commentary, if you looked at 10 commentaries, there'd be 10 stories about why this woman got up and left the guy. She was unfaithful, but she left. And just there's all kinds of extraneous things that are sort of reading between the lines that I don't want us to get involved in. I just want us to take the lessons from the clear teachings this morning and we'll refrain from too much, too much speculating. But the woman was from the area of Bethlehem and she left her husband, that is the man in this story, the concubine's owner, and went back to her family there. It seems to indicate the man was the one offended in a sense and his wife had failed him. So it says she was unfaithful, and so we would think it would be sexually unfaithful. So in a situation like this, what do you do? 
What do you do when someone fails you like that, that close to you fails you? When others fail you, what do you do? It says they separated for four months. She left, went to her parents' house, and there was time to think about it. What would you do? Well, four months is time to steam and fume and get upset. Your wife is gone. It'd be four months is plenty of time to, to look up a good lawyer. Draw out the papers, make sure she doesn't get any of your stuff. Four months is a lot of time. Time to think. Time to make other plans. Time to get another girlfriend. Verse 3. This is what the man did. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her, to bring her back. He had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys. And so she, he arrives there and the woman took him back and took him to her father's house. So after a period of about four months, the husband goes back to the wife. He's hopefully, hopefully, it looks like he's hoping to win her back. And I guess it depends on how you read this or what you read into it. But I see a man perhaps bringing gifts to his wife and to his wife's family. I see a man with two donkeys hoping for the best. And perhaps his way of providing transportation for his wife. I got my donkey. I got your donkey. Let's go home together. Hoping for the best. What would you have done? So we see this hopeful input that the father-in-law gives in this situation. This had to be an awkward situation. Your daughter is unfaithful to her husband. The husband comes to your house to get your daughter. So how's the weather? You know, what do you even talk about? So she brought him back, and the, the girl's father saw him, and he came to him to meet him with joy. That either being a sigh of relief or else the thought that he's got to be up to something. So the wife seems to receive him. The father-in-law certainly seems to accept him and even sort of goes out of his way to affirm his acceptance in his son-in-law. Verse 4. And so the father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay and remained with him for three days. So they ate and they drank and spent the night there. On the fourth day, they arose early in the morning and he prepared to go, but the father, girl's father said to his son-in-law, strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread. After that, you may go. So the two of them sat and ate and drank together. And the girl's father said to the man, Be pleased to spend the night and let your heart be merry. So he joyfully receives his son-in-law back and showed him much favor, sharing a meal, doing some celebrating together that they were back and inviting them to stay another night. So they get up the next day, and the father-in-law continues this very affirming and accepting type of treatment and offers him more food, more drink, and another night's sleep. It happens three more times. And finally, the father-in-law attempts to get the man and his wife, the concubine, the father's daughter, to stay one more night. And the husband starts thinking, maybe this is getting kind of creepy. I don't know. I, I, that's reading between the lines now. I would, I would kind of be thinking, now this, this, this is getting creepy. So he didn't want to any longer. So he takes his donkeys and his wife and they go on their way. 
They travel by an area referred to as Jebus. Jebus was inhabited by Jebusites. Jebus will one day become Jerusalem. But before, they, before it became Jerusalem, it was Jebus. And the servant suggested that he was, that was with this man and the concubine that they go to that town there for the night, still inhabited with Jebusites. But the husband emphatically said, no, well, they were not the people of Israel. They're not our kind. Let's go till we find Gibeah. Gibeah is where our people are. The Benjamins dwell there. The Benjaminites dwell there. They're our people. They're the Israelites. We'll find a place there. So they bypassed Jebus, and they traveled to Gibeah, a town inhabited by the people of the Jewish tribe of Benjamin, their own people. So they were Israelites. That would be the best and safest place for them. So verse 15, it talks about, so they came to the Jewish town of Gibeah, inhabited by the people of Benjamin. They enter into the gathering place, the town of the town, and where strangers typically gathered. And no one by then had offered them a place to stay. It was very cultural. <laughs> If you were around a Jew, for them to invite you in. If you were a traveler, for Jewish people to invite you into their homes to stay overnight. But no one had invited them to stay with them. So they decided to stay downtown in the main square of the city. And then an old man comes by. And he sees them there, begins a conversation with them. And upon hearing that they planned spending the night in the town square, urges them to come to his house and spend the night. The man was very persistent and wouldn't take no for an answer. So they finally gave in and went to stay overnight with the man's and the man's family. Verse 22. So as they made their hearts merry, now this is in the town of Gibeah, inhabited by God's people, the Benjamites, a tribe of the Israelites, this guy's own spiritual family people. As they were making merry, behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows, surrounded the house, beating on the door. And they said to the man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. That is, that we might have sexual relations with him. The same way a man would know a woman, have sexual relationship with a woman, these men are wanting to beat the door down and get this man so that they might have sexual relations with him. As we read this, it sounds an awful lot like Abraham and Lot. When they're beating the doors down and the angels kind of pull them in and, and, they, and they torch the place. And the men of Sodom use the same terminology. Give us the men that are inside. We want to know them. It wasn't like they wanted to swap email addresses and stuff like that, get to know one another. I mean, they wanted to have sexual relationships with them. They wanted to know the men like they would know any prostitute. It's interesting that a single sin never stands alone. It's one thing Judges tell, tells us, especially these last four or five chapters, that a single sin never stands alone. One sin always gives birth or gives way to other sins. What started with idolatry escalates into immorality and now sexual immorality and perverseness of uh, homosexuality. Now there is really nothing right going on in this chapter really. Not a lot of positive anything going on in this chapter. The man pursued his wife. That was positive. But notice the description of what the men were wanting to do. 
And this won't be vulgar, but I'm just going to use the terminology that's in the text here today. And this will help us to know the horrors of these sins. Verse 23. So the man, the ma this is the little old man that found them and took them into his house. The man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Since, there, since this man has come into my house, do not do this vile thing to them. Behold, here is my virgin daughter and this man's concubine. Let me bring them out now. Violate them and do with them what seems good to you. But against this man, do not do any outrageous thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the men seized his concubine. So the man, the little man, the master of the house, seized his concubine, the other man's concubine, and made her go out to them. And they knew her. And abused her. That is, they had sexual relations with her. They raped her, abused her all night long until the morning. And as the day began to break, they let her go. Doesn't get more, much more raunchy than this. Can you imagine being the little old man's daughter? No, don't come in here and do this to this man. Hey, I got a daughter here for you. You know, he's getting ready to throw his, his daughter under the bus. And winds up grabbing the man's concubine wife and forces her out the door. When people fail you, what do you do? Again, not much right going on in this passage. But as the men were trying to get the other men, the old man offered his daughter as well as the concubine. So the old man forced the concubine out to the sin-frenzied crowd. Nothing, nothing right about this. I guess at this point I'm wondering... Why doesn't the men that pursued his wife, why doesn't he say, no, no, this, this can't happen. No, my wife's not going out there. My concubine's no, not going out there. No, I'll go out there. They let them do with me what they want, but my wife's not going out there. No, uh-uh, not going to happen. But this guy is... Silent in 22 languages. He just doesn't say a word, doesn't do a thing, doesn't seem to lift a finger to help his wife. It would be a good time for somebody to say, Oh, we trust in you, O oh Lord God Almighty, help us. Lord, I cried unto you, and you heard my prayer and answered. Psalm 18. It would be a great time to pray one of those prayers to God. You know, if we were a God-fearing man, if they were a praying person, now would be the time to, to, to launch one of, those, one of those prayers. But it doesn't. Verse 29. So, the next morning they had let this Woman, wife, concubine, they finally let her go. The Bible says she makes her way to the door of this house and falls with her hands on the threshold of the door. Next day, her husband, man, slash concubine owner, opens the door and there she is. And he says, get up. Get up. Didn't get up. She was dead. So verse 19. So he took his wife and he went home. And it says, when he entered his house, this is the man with his concubine. He took a knife, taking hold of his concubine, he divided her limb by limb into 12 pieces 
and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And all who saw it said, such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day that the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt until this day. If you're like me, you read this and think, man, this guy is a nut. This guy has lost his mind. But this was, this was his way of holding all of Israel guilty for what happened to his concubine. Even though he did nothing, he appears to have done nothing. This was done as, as though a graphic message to the entire nation of Israel that they were responsible for this death. This is what I have against you, Israel, was what this message was saying. He cut her all up and sent 12 pieces of her to the 12 tribes of Israel, saying, this is what I have against you, Israel. This had happened at the hands of your people. God's people were silent, complacent, passive, responsible. They committed these sins against this woman. It was his way of saying, her blood is on the hands of the whole nation. John Gill writes it this way. He says, The man took this strange and unheard of method to acquaint each of the tribes with the fact committed that he did not do this out of disrespect to his wife, but to express, it, to express the vehement passion he was in on account of her death in the way it was, and to raise their indignation at the perpetrators of it. So, when people fail you, these are some colossal failures, right? In a little bit of a summary before we get to application, but a little bit of summary, we see a contrast between the lack of hospitality of the people of Gibeah contrasted with the hospitality of the old man who took them in. We see the contrast between the enemies of Jebus and God's people of Benjamin being guilty of such a horrific sin. When people fail you, what do you do? Well, the husband attempted to reconcile with his wife. I think that's commendable. The very intention of reconciling with those who have failed you or offended or offended you is the biggest hurdle. Getting to the point where you're willing to make it right with the other person who has offended you is the biggest hurdle. The willingness to do what is right before God is always the hardest because it was not the battle of how to make things right, but whether I want to make things right or not. Oftentimes when we're hurt and angry, sometimes we just want to stay that way. There's something about anger and pain that we like. Something about it we revel in. And sometimes we don't want to give it up. So the husband attempted to reconcile with his wife. The father-in-law attempted, attempted to help breach and to orchestrate reconciliation between his daughter and the concubine's husband. I think that's commendable. What he did later is not, but that part I thought was very commendable. It seemed like he was trying to do what he could do to help facilitate family relationship reconciliation. The old man in the square intervened and attempted to avert such sin, even though his resolution was just his resolution was just as bad, handing the woman over to the people. The husband attempted to call for justice, although it was a horribly graphic and we would probably say an improper act. There's just not much right with this whole story. 
It really reminds us of the seriousness of sin, the horrors of unrepented and perpetrated sin. Everyone does what's right in their own eyes, and it only gets worse. And the fact that one sin doesn't stand alone for very long. Sin gives birth to further sin. Idolatry gives birth to immorality. So verse 30 is where it ends. Such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day of the people of Israel since the day they came out of the land of Egypt until this day. And it just has a very awkward, not a sentence, it's not proper grammatic, uh, grammatical structure. It's just like, and you don't find, I don't think, another verse like this in the Bible. Just these words kind of in the text. Consider it. Take counsel. Speak. That's not a sentence in the original writings. It's just words like, this is just what's on my mind. I'm writing it. Doesn't make sense. It's just consider it, take counsel, and speak. Matthew Henry gives these sins what? Consider it. That would be a warning. Be warned. Do not ignore what has taken place here. Take heed of its reality. Let every man retire to himself and weigh this matter impartially and fully in his own thoughts and seriously and calmly consider it without prejudice. Consider it, be warned. And then it's the, the two words, or the, for, our, for us it's two words, take counsel. Matthew Henry writes, it's something to talk about. It's an it's a invitation to own it. Let them freely talk it over and every man take advice of his friend. Know his opinion and his reasons and weigh them in light of this catastrophe. Any offense, any sin must not be overlooked or swept under the rug. Sin begets sin. Wickedness begets wickedness. Talk about it. Take counsel. And then speak. Get it out in the open. Do not remain silent on what's taking place. Let every man speak his mind and give input, input according to his conscience. Make the issue known. Address the sin, but address ours first. Can you imagine if a part of every baby that was ever aborted in America was mailed to every household in America with a note attached in that baby's blood? My blood is on your hands. That's kind of what this man is doing. These were not merely personal sins, but were made national sins of Israel. As I was studying, reading through this, it just dawned on me that our own personal sin is not our own personal sin. Our own personal sin, especially as Christians, becomes the sin that people around us associate with and ascribe to Christians or the church. Each time another Christian falls in ministry or fails in sexual immorality, it's plastered all over the media. Or if they abuse a child or violate another person, the world sees the sins of one more Christian. Not just Joe, but this Christian. They're all alike. So today, when people fail you, what do you do? I would say the Bible says in Leviticus 19, do not hold grudges. Do not hold a grudge. Leviticus 19 and verse 18. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26. Do not harbor hatred and bitterness in your heart. Don't hold a grudge. Don't hold grudges. The man uh, whose concubine was unfaithful to him 
He could have held a grudge, but it looks like in those four months he worked through that and it was more important, at least at that point, to win his wife back. Don't hold grudges. Don't revel in your anger because that's easy to do. Secondly, forgiveness. Matthew 18, verse 21 tells us what to do when people have offended us or wronged us. It's a process. You go to the person. If they won't listen to you, you get, you get a couple of people, a couple of witnesses where two or three are gathered together. That's what it's referring to. It's not referring to prayer. It's referring to working out your differences. And do what's within your power to do so to make things right with the, with the other person when people have failed you, when they have offended you. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, Cast all your cares upon the Lord. Try casting your cares upon the Lord. If somebody in that whole chapter and all those events, some religious Jewish person would have said, Almighty God, you know, we ask for your help. Our Lord, we're in trouble. Or, Lord, there's a mess, but we don't, we don't see that. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Don't hold grudges. Do what's in your power to do so. And if it's not, pray to God to help you, but try forgiveness. Try to forgive a person. I've heard it said that, don't forget you can't forgive somebody unless they ask for it. I think that's hogwash. Well, if they don't deserve it, then they're just going to do it again if you forgive them. That's, that's the mindset behind that. If they don't repent, then they don't deserve forgiveness. I got ten important points regarding forgiveness that nobody else, doesn't affect anybody else but you. Forgiveness is self-purifying both mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Forgiveness is self-purifying. Gets that poisonous grudge, anger, unforgiveness out of your heart. Out of your heart. Forgiveness is self-purifying. Secondly, forgiveness is freeing yourself from the control of others. As long as you hate somebody and refuse to forgive somebody else, you know what? That person has control of you. And if you think about it, I don't think you want another person controlling your emotions or your spiritual life. Forgiveness is freeing yourself from being controlled by others. Thirdly, forgiveness is doing what is in your power to do what is right before God. Try to make things right. Try to reconcile. Try to, try to seek forgiveness. Fourthly, forgiveness protects your prayer life. Forgiveness protects your prayer life. Matthew 6, verse 14. Fifthly, forgiveness of others places you in right standing before God in your own relationship with Him. Last thing you want to do is step into eternity and God says, what about all those people you still hate? What about all those people you stepped into eternity, you died hating all those people and refusing to forgive them? Forgiveness places others in right relationship before God in your own relationship with Him. Sixthly, forgiveness releases you from the foothold or stronghold of the evil one. If you hold a grudge, that is a foothold. If you hate somebody, that's a stronghold. If you want to kill somebody and if you refuse to forgive somebody, you're in bondage. Forgiveness releases you from the foothold or stronghold from the evil one. Seventhly, forgiveness gives you a clean conscience and leaves you blameless. Eight, forgiveness clears you from future accusations of failing to care enough to try to make things right. Well, I tried. You can honestly say, I, you can't say I didn't try. Once you try to forgive somebody else, you know what? You put the ball back in their court and they can do with it what they want. But for you, your conscience can be clean. Nine, forgiveness breaks the cycle of being overtaken by a myriad of other sins such as bitterness, hateful, uh, hatred, slander, and even murderous thoughts. And ten, forgiveness presents others with an example 
of what could take place when people work out their offenses from a biblical perspective. Forgiveness presents others with an example of what could take place when people work out offenses from a biblical perspective. Ephesians 4 verse 30 says this, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption, but let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander, slander, slander is evidence that you hate or can't forgive or are angry or are bitter towards another person. And that grieves the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice and be ye tender hearted towards one another, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. When people fail you, what do you do? Or what should you do? Just some options. But I want to close with this. There's a flip side of this coin. If there's someone who was offended, that means there's an offender running around out there somewhere. And what if you and I are the offender? When I fail somebody, what should I do? When you fail somebody, what do you do? Let's turn it back on ourselves. When I fail somebody, what should I do? One commentary says this, confess offenses, seek forgiveness, and pursue reconciliation. At least the, the man in this story, he pursued reconciliation. But confess offenses, seek forgiveness, pursue reconciliation. And I would say apology. Apologize. Apologize communicates the value of a relationship. If you're familiar with Gary Chapman, Five Love Languages, he actually has a five language of apology. That's one more five languages book, but I think that's the best book he's ever put out. I encourage you to get that book. Gary Chapman says this, you cannot have a meaningful relationship of any kind without apology. Without apology being an option or a part of that relationship. And these are the five points and we'll be done. When I fail others, what should I do? Apologize. Number one, I'm sorry expresses regret. I'm sorry, expresses regret. Number two, I was wrong. These are hard words for a lot of us, right? I was wrong, accepting responsibility, taking ownership of the wrongdoing. And this is the whole back page of, page of your bulletin is dedicated to these points if you hadn't already found them. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? A desire for that relationship to be restored. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Number four, I don't want this to ever happen again. That expresses repentance and the intent to change. I don't ever want this to happen again. In other words, I don't ever want to do this again. I don't ever want to act that way again. I don't ever want to cause this problem again. And fifth, relational restitution. How can I make it up to you? Sometimes people are quick to blame the other person. 
You know, they were, they were, if, if somebody tried to do this and said, honey, you offended me. Well, you shouldn't have. You're the one that... That's kind of a, that's kind of an immediate knee-jerk reaction. Well, if you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have said that. If you'd have been doing what you're supposed to be doing, I wouldn't have said those words. It blames somebody else. But taking ownership, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? I don't want this to happen again. How can I make it up to you? And making it up to a person is the process of building trust all over again. In other words, you've got to earn it. And I think that's valid, don't you? If someone says, sorry, what does that mean to you? Nothing. Sorry means nothing. But these things sincerely expressed express a genuine apology in order that healing can take place. None of them, it's not an incantation, it's not magic, but it's a start in restoring a relationship. So when others fail you, what should you do? Forgive. When I fail others, what should I do? Apologize. The A word. Apologize. Holy Father, as we come to you today, Lord, this is, this is, it's, 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 this, this account reads like science fiction or a horror movie. Not just because it's bloody, but of the, of the hurt, the, the distrust, uh, the failing of other people, the disappointment of people, people they trusted. Lord, when situations like this occur, we need your help. We just simply... As human beings, we like to hang on to hurt and anger. And we need your Holy Spirit to convict us and to ben, begin to quench the anger and begin to quench the hatred and the bitterness, and even the revenge that we know to be so destructive. And Lord, we need the grace to do what what needs to be done to counteract our fleshly, sinful nature. We need your Holy Spirit. We need you to recreate in us a new heart, uh, to purge these things from us, to pour out the love of God in our hearts, to give grace to us, to stir up forgiveness in our own hearts and lives, and humility. Lord, when it comes down to what do I do when I fail somebody? Lord, we pray your Holy Spirit would be there to work in us in an appropriate way to restore important relationships. And we'll trust you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what in the world did God put a chapter like that in there for? Have you ever thought that? What was he thinking? What was he thinking? where I dwell so that you don't make these mistakes and when you need the Holy Spirit more than life itself that's when Christ is formed in us and we won't repeat these mistakes Amen. it's horrible mistakes so let's stand and sing this <laughs>
no one repeats that chapter ever again. Well, you know, that uh, that was a pretty gory, uh, again, I'm glad the kids weren't in here. That was kind of a gory, um, horrific type of a chapter. Um, but what Faith said, I think, is very important. You know, we can't say that could never be me or that could never be us. That was marital. That was national relationships with you know, same same uh, group of people. It could just as easily be church related mm -hmm. as anything else. So it's something we need to be uh, be aware of and uh, mindful of as well. Uh, it's a nasty, but it's a valuable chapter in the Bible for sure. Well, if anybody has a prayer need, uh, we'll be here to pray with you after the service, uh, confidentially for whatever might be on your heart. And please remember, we are having a an agape dinner downstairs after the service, and everybody is. Welcome and invited to join us downstairs. We'll have plenty for everybody. So I uh, have some good fellowship for a while. I'll close in a word of prayer and we can be dismissed. And we'll give thanks for the, for the food and things as well. Lord, we thank you for your holy word and, uh, and uh, for your Holy Spirit. Uh, holy Spirit, we pray you take your word and, and, and address our hearts. If any of this applies to any of us. At the present, especially, Lord, and we want to, we want to be right before you, Lord. We want, we don't want to think that that's not me or I've never done that. But Lord, help us, help me, help us, Lord, uh, to be godly and to be holy in, in your sight, um, to share in your holiness, Lord, um, to take the steps to make things right in whatever relationship might be strained. And we'll thank you for it and trust you for it, Lord. Thank you for the food that's been prepared for all those who have worked and prepared things, those who are serving us, those who have been downtown, downstairs, uh, getting things together and making everybody sure everybody's food is hot and ready, Lord. Thank you for those folks down there, Lord. Uh, bless them and bless our fellowship together, Lord, we pray in Christ's name, amen.